Today I'm going to present just a very small piece of the project that was the urban planning bit. But you know, there, there are a lot more layers in each project that go on, like the heritage conservation layer, the community layer. And I'm so glad that I'm uh, presenting after so many great um, presentations, starting from the detail of the window to coming down. So it's really about everybody coming and having this dialogue. And that's why I'm very happy that this is happening. OK, so here we are. We are a very, as you can see, all the happy faces. That's what make, makes our firm. Uh, we are all youngsters who have come back to the country after studying in different parts, only because we wanted our education to help cities, um, our own cities, develop. And if you see the map below, that's all the universities uh, uh, and the work where we have already worked uh, when we were living in other countries. So um, in India, in the last three years, these dot represents some of the cities that we have worked on. And being a young firm, we've got the opportunity to work on completely barren landscapes, you know, cities that are just starting to construct, like Nayaraipur, and also had the privilege to work on a city like Jagannath Puri, uh, where Ms. Gurmeet Rai was, after being stalked and troubled for a long time, allowed us to be a part of her team and you know give our two cents to the amazing project. So um, go next. So yes. Yeah, so I thought what what since we are talking about milestones and stuff, the sustainable development goals. This is something very global, and it's also very complex because there are 17. So for us, planning process is the most important, and the process can be taken into anything from construction to a house to construction of a city. So today I'm going to talk about six mantras and how, no, go back. OK, quest for relevant Indian solutions. This is something that we learned uh, is very important for each city in India. Like someone rightly said that even if you go from one village to the other, it could be completely different because the community is different, the demographic is different. So the solution they need is different. We do not need robots helping us to construct. We have a lot of power. So this is a simple design solution that I think captures the essence of how design can actually help um, in context. So OK, so because of this, uh, and inspired by this, and several other uh, works that we have seen today, um, we have developed these six mantras. So the first one is respond contextually. Second one is connect efficiently. Third one is develop equally. Fourth one is build intelligently. Sixth one is invest strategically. And seventh one, which is the most important one, is collaborate actively. And this is the process that our firm has followed and also we have followed for any project that has come. Even if someone has come and said, you know, I have a parking lot, can you redesign it? We have made sure that some essence of each of these principles becomes a part of that design. So go next. So let me start with respond contextually. OK, so now we are in a situation where a lot of our cities are becoming urban. A lot of our living style is becoming urban. And one of the statistics is that by the end of 2030, 41% of our population will be urban. So the task for urban designers and city planners and government officials is huge because they have to really up their game and you know make sure that this disaster doesn't happen. One gentleman rightly said that you know something as small uh, as important as waste management can become something that can become the biggest disaster if this continues and we are not able to cope up and put the right systems in place now. So and at the same time, climatically, we are facing a lot of challenges. Temperatures are rising, glaciers are melting, and you know you have faced. Um, a very unfortunate incident some years ago. So these are some challenges that real India is facing. But at the same time, if you look at our cities, and if you see how they have evolved, there is certain principles and learnings that are very important. For example, the city of Jodhpur is in, in the middle of a desert. But because of the system that they put in place of different water um, storage systems, even today, the city is able to s store water. So one of the learnings we learned that it really, the, the city of the entire system of the 
uh, responded to its context, its geography, its climate, and of course its people. At the same time, we are sitting at the top of a massive crisis where the entire northern region of India is losing its water table. And this is because of the rapid development that's happening. And Delhi is actually quite at the epicenter where Gurgaon is facing a lot of issues now with groundwater tables and you know all of this is uh, if 0.65 meter drop in groundwater table is going to happen by the year uh, uh, in every year then we are sitting on a massive water crisis so at the time like this when we were approached um, again as a part of uh, CRCI and Ms. Gurmitra's uh, multidisciplinary team we had the opportunity to work on two small villages in Rajasthan the first thing we went there we, we met the people and they were living very sustainable lives they were very uh, very community cluster 4000 people in the village of Garbhor but the, the place where the village was uh, situated was right at the Sayadris. So, and this is the geology and geography of the, th the village that, the, uh, that surrounded the village. And it was very important to understand this before we start uh, identifying. It was important to understand what kind of birds come here. It was important to understand what are the water bodies, what is their nature. It was important for us to map what are the different rivers that are flowing, what are the different water streams that are flowing, what is their flooding uh, pattern, what is, uh, and how nature has responded to it over so many years. And before actually giving them the area that they can develop on, we had to give them the area that they cannot develop on. That was something that you had to put in first, that okay, you want the population to increase, you want development to happen, and you definitely want a vision because it is uh, even a small village like this, which has people that actually are enjoying a very beautiful uh, culture. And this is a picture of uh, the Jal Jhulni festival that happens. And a village suddenly sees a, a high in the tourists. So a village of 4,000, just because of this uh, festival, suddenly has 10,000 pilgrims coming in. So it also needs to respond to that constant pressure of being able to get facilities for those tourism uh, departments to be able to generate economy for its own youth so that they can stay back, so that they don't go running to Mumbai finding jobs, and at the same time also develop in course with nature. So, after, so the red zones that you see in this were pockets that we found were develop, developable, but even then we did not mark all of them as developable, only we did a full population calculation on what is the aim population that they need and hence how much land do they need after subtracting the land that they cannot build on. The next thing we did was if you see the um, the temple is in the center and it's kind of like a walled village where um, uh, the village is actually within a fortress like walled village and you want, and they have this relationship with the water. So during the Jal Jhulni festival, they actually take their idol all the way to the water and back. That is the process that they go through. So it's very important to connect them to the village. So we created these green ways, green ways that would connect the lifestyle of the villages to the water, which would not be a part of the developable land, which would also um, become chargras, where their cattle can, you know, um, uh, and their uh, grass fedding can happen and also become these multi-use spaces for the youth so uh, sports areas and you know playgrounds and all those things and and the reds that you can see are ident identified lands that can have new development go next and then the next thing we had to do was put in a social filter on it what are the spaces that you want people to gather because like someone rightly said if people are having like fun with each other, then the tourists would want to come and join them. Tourists will never create that fun. You want to see, you come to a place and you want to see how people live there. So these are spaces that within the kilo, five, min five minutes walking radius from each um, cluster where you could put in important social amenities. You put in schools, you put in uh, sports grounds, you put in healthcare centers, and all of them create this social node that becomes the active area of that small little community cluster. 
And then identify really important uh, pilot projects that would be key insertions within this bigger vision that you have created for an area. These pilot projects are something that, that the tourism department or the development authority can take up as their own little uh, quick starts, quick wins, or what they call low hanging fruits. You start these and you have already sown the seeds towards the right way of development. So, you know, a lot of the times everybody's uh, asking, uh, how do you, uh, you know, implement such a big master plan? You actually implement the vision. So you keep a vision in mind and then you start these small steps towards that vision. So actually the vision is same for per city and every, de de every department works towards that vision. So if the vision is to create a sustainable development of this village, then every department will do its two um, you know, small bit to work in that direction. So this is just a view of the existing village and the framework that we put in for the new additions to be added. So that the, frame, uh, so that the new construction of the buildings also don't look alienated to the olden parts. And uh, this is another view. And you can see the temple in the center. And a lot of the pilot projects was about the immediate um, place making around the temple. And uh, Gurumit had worked very hard on how, how do you create uh, a kind of uh, a visitor uh, in as soon as they come into the village, what is the first place you want them to enjoy and stuff. These are these very quick wins that you can do in the village. Um, the next thing uh, was a, a separate kind of a, a thing we were working on. It was the River Musa in uh, Jagannath Puri. And here the problem was a little different. Here this was already a natural heritage, but, and it, to, as development had happened, somewhere people forgot about this river and had al already built on where the uh, river was meeting the bigger river. So what had happened, it had become like a stagnant water. It had water hyacinths. It had become the malaria breeding, breeding ground. Uh, and that was the reason why a lot of uh, malaria incidents were recurring in uh, Puri. So when we had to work on an existing water body, we had to analyze what were the different uh, uh, kind of vegetation species that were around, what are the different important uh, elements that are on this river, what is the problem, why is it not meeting, and what is the different kind of solutions. Now, something at this scale is, something, uh, is, is definitely not a master plan you can draw, but uh, as, the, as, as one of the requirements of Hriday was to create a toolkit, we created a toolkit of guidelines on what are the guidelines that over a period of time the government can take up to restore this river to its natural form. So how do you protect the river zone? How do you create a river accessibility and buffer zone? And also how do you create an urban zone? And what are the some of the guidelines? I wouldn't say they were the only guidelines that would follow, but some of the things like do not build on the river something very basic that needs to be written somewhere and the government needs to say, okay, this is a no-build zone. Okay. So this is just a sample of a guidelines and the document is actually two documents this thick um, are available on the Hriday website. Um, the next one is connect efficiently. Now this is very important because um, I wanted to use this painting of Chandni Chalk as an example, because if you see, you know, in our, all our paintings, there were these Hathi, Ghoda, Palkis. It was not just this one mode of transportation that was there. So we've always had streets that were multimodal. And somewhere, so it's about creating these different, um, every road needs to give equal priority to each of these people. Because, and in fact, more priority to mass, mass transit and public transportation than to some, a, a private vehicle. Uh, just an example on how walkable cities are actually very good for the environment because as we become denser, as we become more urban, you will actually need to move people from, and today we are facing several vehicle congestions. Yesterday I went around and I'm, I saw some of the problems that Srinagar is facing, you know, the vehicular congestions that you're facing at intersections. And this is something that cannot probably be the immediate solution that comes to your head is, okay, let's widen the road, or let's you know, make something else for the cars to go. That might be one 
of the part, but it's not the whole solution. So the idea is to talk about how do you move people and not cars. And uh, this will be touched upon tomorrow, I guess, in the mo mobility chapter. But just to show you an example, we have Gurgaon, which had 60 meter wide streets, 60 meter wide streets in the middle of the city. Now these streets can actually be designed for so many more transit systems than just the cars. That would actually make the streets more livable, more viable. You can have bazaars there, you can have, you don't have to go to, in Gurgaon, you actually go to malls to buy your bhaji also. So, you know, you don't want that kind of disaster to come to a city. And then when we, uh, it is also important to create a framework that includes different kind of cities. Uh, this, the framework needs to include all di types of transportation hubs. Uh, how does the parking work? How do uh, interchanges work? How would you, if you have a mass transit, how do you shift to an auto from there? And also about creating uh, the heritage scale, which is very important. Gurmeet touched upon it. How in our older cities and, you know, like downtown Srinagar we went, how you, there are always these challenges. Everybody's buying cars. Where do you park them? How do you reach somewhere? And these are challenges that every heritage city in India is facing. And there are several different kind of solutions and innovative uh, combinations that can come into place. And not just one solution is what I wanted to say. Uh, for um, uh, compact, walkable neighborhoods of the past, this is very important. In, in, in history, we have always had beautiful, shaded uh, neighborhoods where people would talk to each other, people knew when someone would scream in someone else's house that there's something wrong there. I think we're losing that culture. And because of that, when we had the opportunity uh, to work, we did a simple analysis on what is the walkability um, of different places that we look up to. So um, for example, in uh, a simple cal mathematical calculation is, uh, we did number of intersections per square kilometer is directly related to how walkable a place is. So Venice uh, is a, a old city and an actually non-motorable and very walkable. It comes with 580 intersections. Uh, Los Angeles in USA is 56. There's a suburban town in US, which is Irvine, which is um, six. Then when we came up to Garbhor, we decided to have a combination of pedestrian and vehicle so that it, it because traditionally you would walk in the city. If you look at the plan, you would say, oh, that's just such a grid grid type plan, but it actually isn't. If you compare the grid, grid that we put in Garbhor to say a grid of Chandigarh or a Jaipur or a Udaipur, our grid actually is very, very small. And what we wanted to do is create smaller sellable plots because uh, the way people live in the village is having these really small havelis and uh, between those havelis there were alleyways to go in and you could walk, you didn't have to walk along uh, for like 100 meters before you turn. So create a network that would, even with the new plots, have this walkable aspect, have smaller uh, areas where children can play, where, you know, um, mothers can work and see their children playing in the garden and create a very walkable and uh, neighborhood that would fall into the context of Rajasthan. Uh, the third one, which I think was touched in the last conversation, was develop equally. I think it's very, uh, this is a, a good example we thought was the Indus Valley civilization, the, which actually had the public space at the center of the civilization. And if you were to you know, interpret that in a modern way. That would be where people come together, people have fun, people eat, people shop. So we wanted to create social spaces that actually respond to that. Whereas a lot of our cities in India are right now facing challenge of social exclusion. We are, because of that, we're facing security issues. We are facing, uh, um, you know, obesity issues. If we were walking at one point and now we're only going by car, you're getting fatter and fatter. If you don't cycle anymore, you're getting fatter. So all those things become a problem. So how do you plan for enabling infrastructure that includes a lot of social programming? So this is uh, a concept we had put in the master plan for Gurgaon, was a social hub. And how a social hub can be within five minutes walking distances and use the existing open areas uh, and become these uh, open spaces that would be programmed with, say, bazaars which is something that is uh, very cultural, uh, sports areas. Our children, we don't have enough sports athletes 
from our country, even though we have such a large population. So how do you create areas where you give them world-class sports facilities? How do you create areas where synergy between social, recreational, and sports takes, takes place so that you create active by programs, open spaces? These could be small uh, neighborhood spaces or large public spaces. And how do you create uh, and make them live? How do you make them approachable for people and for all, all kinds of people, not just one elite class? How do you make them usable so that you also teach them? Uh, build intelligently is basically, our infrastructure was always a combination of infrastructure and social space. And somewhere now, a lot of our cities, this, is, this could be any city in India. I'm not even going to tell you which city it is. This is the problem of most areas. And I think a lot of this was touched upon the last session, where a lot of people were talking of decentralization. Now, in a planning, decentralization can come up to a community level, and an architecture, like ma'am rightly said, can also come up to an architectural level. But a lot of government thinks, we always think of making one massive landfill. Why not have a, like a downtown community uh, compost center? That's it only for downtown people, and then have a smaller center somewhere else where people, uh, where it's easier for them to go, and it's a smaller population that you're gathering to. Yeah, and these are different systems that can be put in place uh, working with the government, and these systems can be something that can be done at a smaller cluster community level, and you also take into consideration what are the pra traditional practices that they have gone through. A lot of our uh, gober gas, uh, becomes biogas. That is something that is native to us. So why not do that? Why don't we do that? The other thing is invest strategically. Now this is an example of Mumbai. In 1928, there was a church gate station that was made. It was over designed for that time. Cause, um, and even in 2010, with, for the population that we have now, it is still sustaining. So it was a very in intelligent investment. And this is where pilot projects play an important role. You invest in the people, you invest in economies, and you invest in systems so that that can go on for a very long time. And public infrastructure so that it's not something that just the tourists would use or something. It's something that even the locals would use. And they would actually use it so well that the, anybody who comes from outside would want to go and see how the locals are having fun there. Identifying pilot projects and creating a vision, I think this was talked about last time, where it's very important to have one vision. And the third one is, um, uh, the last one which is important is collaborate actively. How do you collaborate with people? How do you collaborate with communities? How do you collaborate with stakeholders? How do you collaborate with different government bodies? We have gone and just played advisory roles as uh, with the government where we were on their side listening to other consultants and even that helped them. So any kind of role, any kind of, um, all the experts here I think are ready to play any kind of role to help in development and that's what makes, you know, really good cities. So in the end I would like to say that, you know, you can play Farmville on your phone uh, but that will not really actually improve your farming skills. So technology, a city is about people first, and even tourism should be about locals first. And if you make locals happy and have fun with each other, the tourists will come to see them. Thank you.